Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at ARG, which stands for Artists Against Rampant Government Homophobia. This is a benefit anthology that was uh, envisioned uh, or created by Alan Moore. At this time, in 1988, Alan Moore had his own comic company. Very lasted very short a short time. Um, he published uh, the first two issues of Big Numbers, his uh, ill-fated comic book with Bill Sankovich, and he published this. This was the first publication of, from Mad Love Publications, and um, it was made in response to a a clause or a section of the law that was being trying to be passed. It was called Clause 28. And Clause 28 was a really horrible law. Um, even if you believed in what it, its shitty uh, intent, it was just badly worded and very vague, very ridiculous. And basically it was a, a anti-homosexuality bill. Um, they didn't like the idea of kids learning about homosexuals in school, um, certain books were in the school library, which said it's okay to be gay, basically. And just like now in America, people didn't like that. They didn't like their kids getting poisoned by this shit. So this law actually would basically stated that not only do we want to get rid of any homosexual influence in the schools, which would mean like no more Oscar Wilde, no more Andy Warhol, all these great artists throughout history, even Shakespeare, a lot of people suspected Shakespeare was gay. So it not only did it want to get rid of all that stuff, it also claimed the abstract concept of homosexuality we want to eradicate. Like somehow erase the whole idea that there is a thing called homosexuality. So it's, it's insane that they were trying to pass this law. And luckily it didn't win. Maybe, because uh, of this comic. No, I doubt it. But this was very nice. Uh, the Alan Ward thought of this. Um, nobody got paid for it. The printing was all donated. It was a totally great benefit book to fight this Clause 28. Um, as we can see, it starts off with a bang. I mean, there's there's so many heavy hitters in this. Because, you know, it's Alan Moore. And he, this is after Watchmen. He's the heaviest of all hitters. So he used his clout to get just some of the biggest names in all fields of comics, all genres. It's pretty impressive, this anthology. So right off the bat, we got Dave McKeon doing a beautiful cover. This is Dave McKeon's, you know, late 80s style, uh, before Cages, and, um, you know, beautiful photorealistic style, but then also using multimedia collage -y type stuff. And uh, really nice stuff. The logo was by Ryan Hughes, the, the great graphic designer, you know, logo maker. Uh, this guy's pretty hot shit the past few years, but this is like very early in his career. Really nice striking logo. There's the logo for Mad Love. Unfortunately, it didn't last too long. So here we go. The contents page. And here's the information about how the profits from this will be given to the Organization for Lesbian and Gay Action to fight this shitty law. Man, this is a great anthology. The weird thing about this is it'll probably never be reprinted because, you know, it was of its time. It was only published to make money for this thing. And I think some of these stories have never even been reprinted anywhere else. And it's a shame. So if you can find this anywhere, I, th I don't think it's easy to find. Pick it up for sure. And you'll, after I show it off to you, I'm sure you'll want to, because this is great stuff. So we start off with Alan Moore, you know, at, at his height of popularity. He wrote the story, The Mirror of Love. And he got Stephen Bissett and Rick Veitch to draw it. So this is some great shit. Very weird, interesting story. It's basically like the history of homosexuality, like going back to like pre-human times. You know, talking about how dolphins... It was natural for them to basically switch their sexuality depending on what season it was. Sometimes they'd have same sex sex or sometimes, you know, with the opposite sex. It was just whatever. There's no biggie. It was, just, it was all pleasure. It was nice. 
Um, they talk about the early, like almost pre-human civilizations, like when we were kind of half monkey people. And just for thousands of years, it was a matriarchal society. Nobody knew that men's semen impregnated women. They just thought women were like these miraculous things who could create babies. So, you know, they were left alone. And it was a pretty nice time, apparently. But, you know, of course, religion comes around. And uh, I'm sorry, actually, Alan Moore says three million years of motherhood. So a lot of the history there is, uh, you know, it was like this matriarchy. But like I said, religion comes around and all of a sudden it becomes a patriarchy. Guys were sacrificing babies, men, I, I should say. The word was law. Women scorning men had teeth crushed with burned bricks. Even uh, He even talks about how um, a lot of the Christian uh, animosity towards homosexuality, probably just because, I guess, I don't know if it was proven or a rumor, but the Canaanites were supposedly their priests were like sodomites. They uh, practice homosexual sex. And it was just a, uh, the is Israelites wanted to conquer the Canaanites and take all their land and rape their women. So they this was a nice excuse for them. Like, oh, what they're doing is against God's word. So we have every right to go in there and fuck with them. So the Biscuit uh, comic is kind of split. I'm pretty sure this is all Steve Bissett, which he hasn't drawn this way in a long time. That like almost photorealistic style, very heavily shaded, really... um nice art and that's like the history lesson part but then at the bottom of every page is almost like just this nice poem featuring these two um i guess uh hermaphrodite angels um i, I think maybe i should say intersex i don't know if hermaphrodite's a dirty word or a wrong word but they have both genitalia of male and female and and characteristics of male and female and then this is like a poem about them and how they, they're, they're, apparently they're eternal. So they've seen all this history and their reaction to it. So now we continue with the story and uh, we see Greece. This is a very problematic panel though, because it's kind of glowingly almost saying like, ah, oh, look how civilized the Greeks were. And they practiced man, boy, love without compunction. And it was just great. You know, it's almost the message you get from this pair uh, this panel. And I'm pretty sure, like, gay people would take umbrage at this. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't think they'd be cool with it. It's like, no, we're gay. We're, we're not into pedophilia. Um, you know, consenting adults is the rule that most 99.9% .9 of people follow or should follow, hopefully. But so this is very weird. Um, talks about the Spartans. How it was almost like homosexuality was encouraged with the soldiers because they figured that they'd fight to the death for their lovers, you know, on the battlefield. Talk about Sappho. But then, of course, the the shadow of Christianity is rising. And, uh, of course, St. Paul. I, I, my theory is that St. Paul, he, he ruined Christianity. All the hateful shit in the Bible, so much of it is him. And he basically is the first person to say, yes, yeah, same-sex love is a sin. Most people were just like, whatever, it's just something people do every now and then. But he was like, no, God doesn't like this. And uh, goes into the beautiful poem. And the poem kind of comments on what we've just read, the history. I wish I could read the whole thing to you. I, I think I'd get taken down for copyright issues. But oh, it's just beautiful Alan Moore writing, you know. Guy's a clever lad. Talk about the Crusades and the, the Knights Templar. During the Renaissance, things free up a little. Talk about Michelangelo, of course. And uh, so during this time, there's some, there's some trends are good. Platonic love between men that's very affectionate is, you know, just seen as okay. Guys holding hands and embracing. I mean, they were probably like full on having sex in behind closed doors. Talk about Emily Dickinson. So uh, as you can see, he's also showing off all these great artists who this clause would basically erase from history. Great writers, 
you know, great playwrights, every, all kinds of arts. Talking about Shakespeare, because there's that theory. I don't think anyone's ever proven it, but, the, you know, that he was gay. They, this is interesting. They talk about in the late 19th century, it was the first time the word homosexuality was ever used. It was like a psychiatrist or a doctor. And he basically saw it as a disorder, a mental disorder. So not a good thing, but not something to be hated. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad as the early Christians who were like stone them or kill them. We see Oscar Wilde being persecuted for being gay. But there's some hopeful things in, uh, in Germany in eight, the late 1800s, 1890s. There was the first protest against anti-gay laws, anti-sodomy laws. So we see the angels again, and they're kind of feeling a little bolstered. And like, yeah, this is, we're feeling strong. But then we get to the Nazi era. And um, of course, we all know what happened then, you know. Thousands upon thousands of, of homosexuals were killed in the concentration camps. And we see the angels weeping. This was a bad time for them, as you could imagine. But then after the war, there's some hopeful things. Allen Ginsberg, Joe Orton in England, the playwright, um, Stonewall, obviously. And so the angels are almost ecstatic here. They're just like, this is great. But then this is all before AIDS. And, you know, we mentioned how AIDS really fucked things up for the gay communities. Not only did it kill a lot of them, but all of a sudden people had like almost quote-unquote, a rational reason to not like homosexuals. It was like, you know, they're spreading this disease. We have to do something. And, all, of course, all these horrible people like Reagan and uh, Maggie Thatcher and, uh, you know, Pat, try to pass these homophobic laws. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, Steve Bissett was always doing collage work back then, always sticking a photo in and then tinting it so it fit the art around it. So here we have a little warning about what Clause 28 will do. How ridiculous it is that all these great artists and writers will be erased from history. And the two angels realize, you know, whatever happens, we'll, uh, we'll face it together with, you know, loving each other. Really nice stuff. This was uh, like 20 years later about. Um, they came out with a, like a nice little, almost like poetry art book of this poem, this prose poem, but the, not with this art. It was just the pages of the writing and that uh, artist Jose Villarubia, the, mostly a colorist, but he's really good at like photo manipulation, kind of taking beautiful photos and collaging them and whatever. So it's illustrated by that kind of stuff. So this comic has never been reprinted like this, the, the actual comic. So just for that reason alone, it's like a lost Alan Moore gem and Steve Bissett and Rick Veitch, you know. I don't know if they've ever reprinted it in any of their collections. I don't think they have. So right there's a good reason to get tracked down this ARG. Here we have David Lloyd, the artist of Alan Moore's V for Vendetta, doing this very abstract one-pager. I don't quite understand it. Beautifully drawn, though. Um, it shows a hand uh, from infancy to old age. I guess showing all the different things hands can do. They can create. You know, he's got a pencil in his hand. They can learn. But then they can have a rock in their hand, like they're throw it in a gun to hurt people. They can also reach out and touch people and guide them. So I, I, I think that's the message he's trying to say. Kind of whatever. Kind of sappy. Here we have this artist I really like, the this cartoonist, Grok. And I looked up Grok, and all I could find was that they have a comic in this, and then they have a comic almost the same year of Stri in Strip AIDS USA, which was a benefit comic in America, which uh, helped, um, you know, fight AIDS. <laughs> well, find a cure for AIDS. And um, so I assume they were a gay cartoonist, probably did cartoons in like gay magazines and newspapers, but, you know, didn't work for comics per se, comic books. But this is just really uh, kind of a funny thing, like how to, f how to keep your family free of homosexuality 
Like, break up all your windows so homosexuals, homosexuals can't sneak in your house. And block the chimney. They might crawl down the chimney. Kind of funny stuff. I like it. I wouldn't mind reading more Grok. This is a beautiful comic. Um, this is... Never heard of uh, the writer Jeff Ryman. And it's drawn by Graham Baker. I think I might have seen this guy in some of those like English independent stuff like Escape. Maybe even in Deadline. I can't remember. Maybe I haven't seen him, but it's wonderful. And I love this like splattery, gray toned. And uh, just this panel of his Mickey Mouse phone exploding is amazing. I love that. Like I wouldn't want a t-shirt of that. But the story is really well written. It's it's about a guy who basically says, one morning I woke up and found out that I didn't exist. My house was still there, my job. I still had stubble on my chin. I still had to polish my shoes. But it was by someone else, someone who was like me in almost every respect. But it was not me. I could not be there. And he's, he looks in the mirror. He's got this weird like helmet mask on, basically covering his real identity. And he sees that everyone else is like that. A lot of other people have these masks on and they, they're not themselves either or they're not allowed to be. And basically it's just like, it's a really nice parable about like, yeah, this guy's a gay guy and one day he wakes up. If Clause 28 passes, it's like, well, I guess I can't be me anymore because I'm gay and that's part of my identity. And But now I can't be. Just a really, just really great writing, great art. This is an amazing comic. This is kind of special. We have a one-page uh, thing from comedian Alexi Sale. He's like one of Amer uh, sorry, one of England's biggest comedians. He was on The Young Ones, did tons of you know comedy specials. He's huge, and it's drawn by Oscar Zarate, the great English cartoonist. Um, these guys actually collaborated on a children's book because um, they're like Oscar Zarate. Um, Probably the thing you would know, he uh, did an Alan Moore graphic novel. He uh, he drew a, a small killing, I think it was called. And um, But he was like the kind of guy, he wasn't in comic books. He was one of those cartoonists who was like in a higher pay grade. He'd be in magazines. He'd design book covers. Um, he'd do children's books. And, you know, that kind of cartoonist. Um, but every now and then, you know, he loved the comic forum. Like I said, he did an Alan Moore graphic novel. He did a Alexi Sale graphic novel. And look at this beautiful illustration. This is, I love his style. Just this like horror show on these faces. So what we're seeing here, it's 1937 and young Maggie Thatcher, her family were visiting Germany. And one night she saw a Nazi book burning. And that's why these faces, faces look so hellish. It's all the Nazis with their ugly, ugly little minds coming out through their ugly faces. And of course, young Maggie Thatcher thinks it's great. She's like, wow, I want to do that when I grow up. Kind of implying that, yeah, if Cl Clause 20, sorry, Clause 28 passes, there'd be a lot of book burn burnings in England. Technically, you'd have to burn all these Oscar Wilde plays and all these art books and Sappho poetry and all that shit. Nice. I like it. Ah, oh, here we have the the great uh, English cartoonist Hunt Emerson, and of course, you know this guy's never that serious, so he takes a kind of a goofy look at the whole clause. He calls it Clause Twenty Nine. I think it's it was Clause Twenty Eight and Twenty Nine, and it seems like he knows about the law. That he kind of tells us uh, what's in the clause. And this great Hunter Emerson cartooning. But, you know, basically he's kind of admitting to the audience, you know. He's uh, saying, yeah, I'm not that political. <clears throat> it's like, basically, I'm a cartoonist. And we see Maggie Thatcher, and he just draws a mustache on her. And he says, ah, you expected some more extreme and grotesque form of comic violence. But ridicule is still the best weapon, and I'm still a pacifist. 
So that's pretty much Hunt Emerson. You know, he's not not very political at all, but he can smell a turd when it comes around. He we have a page from David Leach. Um, I'm sorry, the cartoon is by David Leach. This is just a little uh, thing from Sue Hyde. I think she was an activist, I believe. And just talking about Clause 28. This guy, I looked up David Leach. He was in, like, um, Marvel UK titles. But this looks very goofy and cartoony and actually kind of like fanzine art. It's not very good. But I, I don't know. Maybe he upped his game so he could fit in with the slick mainstream comics. Here we have a page from Dave Gibbons, the artist of The Watchmen, as we all know. And this is almost like just a political cartoon. We see this like fascist bully boy guy and um, there's this double-decker bus. We can see in the windows, all these people are getting beaten up by these fascists, these cops. And he's just leering at these people at the bus stop. Full up, but there's another right behind. And it says, minorities, wait here quietly, please. And all these people are like, you know, minorities is a lesbian woman, I assume. Sorry if I'm assuming. <laughs> And, um, you know, a Southeast Asian guy and a black woman. This is a, this is a good story. It's a Dave Thorpe wrote it. And this artist named Lynn Jamet. I don't know if they're French, though. Maybe it's Lynn Jamet. It's called I Was a Teenage Target. And this is just kind of a autobio story of this guy who back in the 80s like, was pretty unique. It's, it almost seems like he's non-binary, even though nobody used that word back then or identified that way. But he's basically just like, yeah, I don't go around telling people I'm gay or I'm straight. I just, whatever. I, I feel kind of feminine. I feel kind of masculine. Sometimes I like sleeping with women. Sometimes I like sleeping with men. I don't really put a name on it. It's just the way I am. So, of course, he dresses differently because of that. And he's just talking about all through his teenage years, he always got gets picked on by these homophobes and he gets bashed one night just talk about it. even in high school he hated taking his clothes off in the gym he just you know all these macho assholes giving him shit even in high school they were beating the crap out of him but you know he didn't let it uh, beat him down But it took him a while to actually, you know, like, be proud and, you know, not worry about what other people think. Here we have uh, David Shenton. Uh, never seen this guy before or since, but I assume by the fact that these are three comic strips and it says reprinted. I, I imagine he had a comic strip in, like, a gay magazine or a gay newspaper. And I really like his style. It's very nutty looking and, like, fun. And, uh... These are all about um, Clause 28 or just, you know, p politics and, and the gay world. The intersection there of nice stuff. Here we have this guy, Charles Shar Murray. He's the writer of this Friday Night at the Boozer. I looked it up. I guess he was a journalist for the New Musical Express, a music writer. I don't know if he ever did comics. I couldn't find that. He does two comics in here, and it's drawn by Floyd Hughes. And uh, Floyd Hughes did uh, stuff for a lot of the mainstream English publishers, uh, Marvel UK and um, 2000 AD. And this is a very similar story to the one we read uh, a couple pages back. Just kind of a auto autobiographical type tale. We see this guy, I think maybe the author. He's kind of, you know, a, you know, not a macho dude. The kind of guy that homophobes would pick on and call the F word. So the, we see these macho guys in a pub and they're just talking about women so horribly. They're looking at a porn magazine. Of course, our hero is like reading Love and Rockets to show his sensitive side. But, you know, like they're, they're calling the pinups in the magazines dirty little cows. And, oh, what I'd like to do to her. I'd bend her over and blah, blah, blah. Like just being really gross and misogynist. And then they show her, him the centerfold. Like, what do you think of this, mate? And he's just kind of like, oh, not, my, not my scene, pal, sorry. And then the the, the joke, the punchline is like, 
don't you like women? In a very, and then he draws them monstrous. All of a sudden, they're like monsters. They look like trolls and ogres. So that's the, the irony of the joke is that these guys obviously don't like women at all. They just want to stick their penises in them. Let me flip this around. Here we have Posey Simmons. Uh, I don't know much of Posey Simmons, but, you know, reading her page, she's kind of like a, a national treasure in England. Like, she's, for decades, has had uh, comics in The Guardian and um, collections of... And they're kind of adult comics. Um, they're not for little kids. And so, you know, even in, like, the 70s and 80s, they'd collect these books and adults would buy them. So it's almost like they were early adult graphic novels. And she's just, you know, one of those cartoonists like I was describing Oscar Zarate. It's like, yeah, she's not going to draw in a comic book normally. And, in fact, she didn't in this. This is reprinted, too, from 1985, it says. But she donated the strip. And this isn't really about anything about Clause 28 or even homosexuality, but gender roles. Because this guy's a house husband. You know, he's got to do the cooking and the shopping. And all these guys are giving him shit about it. These macho guys are like, well, real men don't shop. So I guess it's kind of pertinent. I like this strip. It's um, Dick Foreman. As you can see, it's very cartoony. And I, I gotta say, not that great. He's, he's not that great a cartoonist. But it works, because it's kind of funny the way he draws. Dick Foreman, though, he went on to draw for, like, Vertigo Comics. And I've seen that work, and it it's definitely slick enough there, you know, for DC. Not good, but it's not like this style. He drew like a lot of those black orchid comics, which I don't think anybody bought or liked. <laughs> but I, it's a re, it's a good satire. It's we see this kid. He's kind of a psycho. We can already tell he's a little psycho, and he's hanging out with his sister, and they abuse the dog. The dog is just look at this dog, poor dog. And um, the father's an utter shit. And he, of course, he works for n nuclear waste dumps, lying about them, PR guy. His mom's just a fucking alcoholic. And then the second to last panel, we see him, he's tortured. He's got his sister tied up and he's going to torture her. And he's thinking to himself, so it really doesn't matter that gay theme books aren't in your school library anymore because there's still lots of books about happy normal families just like us so kind of saying that yeah sure this family is just very heterosexual and very normal by those standards they're fucking degenerates they're horrible people so <laughs> the whole idea of like oh gay people will ruin the fabric of the family it's just like you know it's pretty ridiculous when you look at some of these hetero families Here's a short walk on a cold day. And this is written by Roz Cavani and drawn by Graham Higgins. That guy did a lot of English comics. Really good style. Like, this guy can draw the shit out of stuff. Um, fully formed. He's got his style dialed in. Roz Cavani, I'm not too familiar with. I hate to assume, but I think maybe she's a lesbian uh, writer because this is very like, these. the main characters are two lesbians. And they're heading towards the rally. The anti Klaus. I'm sorry I keep saying that. It's like, it's not Santa Claus. It's Claus 28. And these characters, who I don't know if they've appeared before, because they do seem to have, you know, very vibrant personalities. Like, this is an, just one story among many. But they're like, you know, they're not that political. They're kind of party girls. And they're really down there to hook up and check out the scene. But, you know, it's it's an important issue and it's all these all these gay people are getting all into it and it kind of infects them and they seem to get into it at the end. And they're like, yeah, we got to stop this thing. Here we have Gary Leach, a great English uh, comic book artist, uh, probably best known for Miracle Man, once again, written by Alan Moore. You know, a very like, like Brian Ballin type cartoonist, you know, very straight superhero artist type or science fiction, but lots of lines, really detailed, really great artist. But here's doing something totally different than I've ever seen him do. Obviously, it's a George Harriman crazy cat homage. And 
really captures the style. This is some great Harriman, you know, pastiche. And it's it kind of perfect that he picked this. Because, you know, when the even in 1910, 1920, Crazy Cat was a very weird strip as far as the ambiguity of the sexuality going on in the strip. Um, Crazy would change her gender or their gender. Sometimes Crazy was male. Sometimes Crazy was female. No matter what gender they were, they were in love with this ma male mouse, Ignat's mouse. And no matter what gender they were, Officer Pup, who's in jail here, he was in love with them. So it was like, you can imagine, 1920, you know, people were just like, what the hell? But, you know, it was just very, uh, very interesting. So, of course, this fits perfectly in this book. And Crazy's saying, and Pipper called me crazy. Because, you know, compared to Clause 28, uh, Crazy Cat's downright sane, you know? Because it's such a crazy, stupid law. Really nice. Oh, this is one of the best things in the book. Howard Cruz, who sometimes I love, uh, like, sometimes I, I'm lukewarm. This is hilarious. I was laughing out loud reading this. And it's called Pensworth. I assume Pensworth is a homophobic parliament member. Um, maybe around this time. Maybe he's proposing this Clause 28. I don't know. I should have done research. But he's drawing it. He admits here. He's uh, he, he says that he's channeling the uh, turn of the 19th, 20th century uh, cartoonist Hilaire Belloc. And um, I assume Belloc had this kind of style where it have verse. These all rhyme. And this kind of style. Probably drew for like, you know, punch. Those humor magazines back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we see this little kid, Pensworth, he's little, and he he reads uh, Das Kampf. I'm sorry. <laughs> mein Kampf. And uh, he's kind of enamored. He starts goose stepping around the house. And <laughs> when his grandmother sees this, she's horrified, and she just gets a broom and beats the crap out of him. And she says, how dare you don the dreadful shoes of one who so abused the Jews. And he starts crying and actually he's chastened and he swore to honor Jews forevermore. And to his word was Pensworth true. He tipped his hat to every Jew. And then he joins parliament. But then strangely enough, uh, I guess it's the time of gay liberation. He sees gay guys walking around. He does not like this. Even though he prides himself on being tolerant to Jews, he just out and out hates gay people. He's throwing bricks at him. And it's almost like he proposes the law or is very for this Clause 28. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you're gay, you're out. You could be a great soldier who died for his country. You could be the person who uh, washes and waxes the royal coach for the queen. It doesn't matter. Just no gays. So uh, after years of doing this, just like in a children's story, one day he wakes up and he has a Hitler mustache, like almost by magic. And he says, oh no, what was me? And he tries to shave it off, but it won't shave off. It's almost like magic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then when he goes to see his grandmother, <laughs> who's in her deathbed, and... Uh, it says, and drawing on her final breath, beat Pensworth with her broom to death. <laughs> this panel makes me laugh. Even though she's dying, she still like, lifts the broom up and swats him for being a fucking idiot. The moral impressionable lads of eight should take care whom they emulate. And this is a... I don't know if this has ever been reprinted in any of Howard Cruz's collections or anything. A lot of these things, you know, I think were just used for this benefit and but this should be reprinted. This is really enjoyable stuff. Look at this. The heavy hitters keep coming. Bill Sankovich does the center spread. Um, beautifully drawn, though a little overwrought. It's kind of heavy-handed. Claws 28, spelled claws with a W. And we see these two hands uh, in these, like, leather gauntlets with spikes. And they're ringing out. I think maybe this is the document of Claws 28? 
and he's ringing it out and it's like, I assume gay men and gay women are all being wrung out to die from this horrible law. But you know, this is Bill Sankovich in his prime. It's uh, quite a coup to get him. But then again, Alan Moore was his buddy, so. Now here we get fucking heavy, Harvey Pekar now. Drawn by Gary Dumb and Joe Zabel. Um, I'm sure you guys all know Harvey Pekar. I haven't talked about him in the channel. The master of, the, the godfather of autobio comics. In the early 70s, he was doing autobio comics about his mundane life. But this is another guy's story. He has his friend and he's got a, he basically, it's his story. And this guy's talking about uh, back in the like early 60s, him and his friends were greasers in Cleveland. You know, kind of that kind of, those kind of teenagers. And every now and then this guy would pull up. Very nice guy, well-dressed, seemed kind of affluent. And he would say, hey guys, come on over to my house. I'll give you some money. And he'd give them all the beer they could drink and then would set up a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and have them burp into it. When they were done, he would label the tapes and lovingly store them away in order. So, like, he had this kind of weird kink, you know, that was his thing. I've never heard of that, ever, in all the flavors of human sexuality. I've never heard of that being a turn-on. Sometimes he'd even ask, you know, give him extra money so he could take Polaroids of them um, in their bathing suits. So, obviously, the guy's, you know, whatever, closeted gay, but he obviously has other, you know, kinks. So strangely enough, they all happen to be at this benefit fundraiser for the archdiocese. Because, you know, even though they're greasers, they're good Catholic boys. And their parents probably said, you got to go to this thing. So it's like a big auditor auditorium show. And a local guy comes up. A bi I guess he's a biz businessman. And it's Don the Burp. It's the guy. That's what they call him. The guy who picks them up every now and then. I guess he's an important person. You know, he's well off and prominent uh, member of the community. So then all the greaser guys, they're like, hey, it's Don the Burp. And they start making burping noises and they're like, hey, Don, remember me? And making like gestures. And of course he's mortified. He walks off the stage shaking and red faced. And now we come back to the prison. This guy's like, still thinks it's kind of funny. But, you know, he kind of regrets it. He's like, ah, he was a harmless guy. Too bad, really. He certainly did a lot a lot of good for the young men of Cleveland. Because I guess he gave them a lot of money. But I love that little story. That's a that's a good one. Here we get another contribution, a, a reprint. I guess Art Spiegelman didn't have the time to draw a comic. So he let uh, Alan Moore reprint this uh, one-pager from Short Order Comics, 1974. Real dream. And this is a crazy dream where Art and his girlfriend are looking for some place to make it, to get down. And for some reason, they end up in this gay shoe store. I don't even know what a gay shoe store would entail. I love this clerk. He's got a big boot on his head as a hat. And he says, like, go into these rooms. They're really bathroom stalls, but, you know, it's dream logic. So they start to get down. All of a sudden, there's a raid, a police raid. And the cops come in, busting all the gays they can grab. And they're about to beat up Art Spiegelman. And he, he somehow has a playboy on him. And he pulls it out and says, look, I've got a playboy. <laughs> and so the cops say, okay, let this guy through. He's had a rope. That's a very odd dream. Here we have Kevin O'Neill. Um the uh, artist of martial law, uh, many great um, 2000 AD comics um, and many great DC comics and independent comics. And this is almost like a science fiction story. The day after tomorrow, if clause 28 passed, it's, it's called clause for concern. He was always good with the puns. It is interesting, by the way, it's he wrote this and drew it. I, don't, I can't remember him ever writing before. So this is kind of a rare thing but as you can tell by the like i don't know all these little things written everywhere very kevin o'neill he always did stuff like this in martial law in his comics it's his gender fender here think pink go to the clink so very much like basil wolverton or will elder he loved to put in little sight gags and graffiti messages in the backgrounds so these two people are walking down the street i don't know uh, they may be look a little gay. And in this future, 
there's like claws cops and they basically can just go around and if they think someone looks a little gay, they test them and then I guess lock them up if they're gay. So they say freeze and they give the first guy they grab, they give a test to and they put this thing on. It's called the tackle o meter because you probably know this in England. That's what they call your, your genitalia if you're a man, your tackle. And uh, they show him pictures of male genitalia to see if he gets hard. And then they hear from the other cop who's checking out the other person. They're like, the bloke's a girl. <laughs> and it's it's his sister. So I guess uh, they mistook her for a gay man. When they started inspecting her, they found her vagina, I imagine. And so these they basically say, you're free to go. And these two cops are like, it's kind of funny. They're like, they're total homophobes, obviously, but they're like almost flirting with each other in that weird homophobic way. Like, they're just uh, obviously repressed and really repressed. But it also seems that they really want to fuck each other. So that's nice getting to see any Kevin O'Neill. This guy, uh, Stephen Appleby, he's a fixture of the of UK cartooning. He's another one of those artists. He wasn't in many comics. He had a strip in, I believe, The Guardian, the great English newspaper, and did you know, more upscale stuff. Uh, he was probably in a higher pay bracket than your average comic book could afford. Really funny stuff. He always, you know, his style, this is his style. He's always drawn this way. I've seen a bunch of his stuff in Escape. He used to be in that great English magazine, Escape, which one day I will hopefully show off to you. That's one of my favorite magazines about comics ever made. And um, so I, there's this, it's called Buttocks Heads Rule the World. And it's describing this world in which, you know, this apocalyptic world. And basically in this book, they're doing what Clause 28 is proposing to do. So now in this, like, way in the future, this, like, eight-headed guy, I can't remember his name. He's reading it. It's like, oh, thank goodness it couldn't happen here. This book is frightening. But there's this asshole in this in the future, Captain Planet, I believe these characters were all regular Stephen Appleby characters. He made many strips about these guys. In fact, I think I've read some. And Captain Planet is just an all-around bastard. He finds the book and he likes it. He's like, ooh, this is a good idea. I think I'm going to ban anyone with three heads. And just really shakes things up. His people who hang around him are just like, ah, oh, you fucking moron. Like, <laughs> of course you would emulate this horrible thing. The guy with eight heads is hiding his heads in the sand because he wants to be better safe than sorry. Even though he has eight heads, it could be interpreted that he does have three heads. Finally, they just put him in an isolation booth and let him rant to himself. The sensible people. Oh, man, look at this. Neil Gaiman. I don't think this has ever been reprinted. Neil Gaiman writing uh, the great English cartoonist Brian Talbot of Luther Arkwright fame. And a tale of one bad rat drawing and inks by Mark Buckingham, another great English artist in his own right, uh, penciling and inking. And this is called From Homogenous to Honey. And we see this like narrator. It's kind of implied that he's in power. You know, he's basically telling how him and his ilk have changed the world for the better. He keeps having this mask in front of him that keeps changing from a frown to a smile. It always smiles when something shitty's happening. So he's basically talking about the old world and how sloppy it was and not utopian because we just see all these diverse people. And um, they came upon the solution of just getting rid of any, anything that was contrary to uniformity, just like Clause 28 would do. So he's torching a book in the library. That was easy to get rid of. Bright's head revisited. There's, he's just chopping out the things that are offensive, I guess. Saki. Um, obvious stereotypes would go first on TV. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the guy from Are We You Being Served? I don't know if you ever saw that English sitcom from the 70s. It was, there was no gays on TV in America pretty much in there, like 74. But they had a major character who was uh, not a very... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a very affirmative depiction of a gay man. He's a very mincing, comedic 
kind of stereotype of a gay man, but nonetheless, they did. And I think that's him. Talking about records. No Beatles without Brian Epstein. No more Bowie, no more Communards. He's had a performance of uh, an Oscar Wilde play. And he just like takes a machine gun out and shoots the actors. Yep, took care of that. Just making everything nice and tidy. We see a big book burning and they're lynching all these gays. Um, we see all these like great works of uh, gay art. My Beautiful Laundrette, Caravaggio Paintings, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And then they, they kind of hit this uh, impasse. They're like, what are we going to do about ancient Greece? Are all civilizations based on ancient Greece? So they just decided to nuke it. They nuke uh, classical classical Greece, ancient Greece. And then uh, so at the end, he's very happy. They made this better world where it's a simpler place. All the complications have been taking, taken out. It's a utopia. Everybody's exactly the same. And we see the people in this world, they just have no face. And this guy takes his mask off and he's the same way. Here's what I was talking about earlier. They actually quote from the clause. The clause is aimed at the whole gamut of homosexuality. Even the abstract concept of homosexuality. So that's just nuts. Here's a Kate Charlesworth, another one who the only things I could find that she did were this and Strip Aids USA. So I assume, once again, she was a lesbian cartoonist who probably had lots of work in um, gay magazines and newspapers. And this is pretty funny. It's like a trivia quiz. Like, uh, just like where you stand on gayness. Pretty fun cartooning. This is very um, humorous. I kind of like this. What is promotion of hex homosexuality? Is it rife in the old boy network? The panto season? Sorry, I don't understand that. Men only institutions? I like that. It's like a bishop and a, a younger priest. Kate Charlesworth. And I wouldn't mind reading some more stuff by her. This is a treat. I don't think this has ever been reprinted, especially now. Dave Sim wouldn't, because Dave Sim's a fucking weirdo now. It's an untold tale of the secret, sacred wars by Dave Sim and Gerhard, the regular Cerebus team. And this is a nice little four pager. Um, God, just look at Gerhard. This is such an amazing artist. But um, I guess this was the part in Cerebus where there were these sacred wars going on. So Roach, the Roach guy who always changes his persona, and it was around the time Secret Wars was happening where Spider-Man got the black costume. So he becomes this guy. He's also kind of like a puritanical um, crusader type. So he's like making fun of comic motifs. He's talking to no one, clenching his muscles in uh, angst and whatever worrying about his two assistants, these two guys. He sent them off on a mission to root out perverted behavior, uh, most poss most probably homosexual behavior in the city. So they come back. And uh, they tell him, they're like, well, we did, uh, we just like you asked, we hung outside the males, the public restroom. And we were behind the bushes checking out what, what's going on. And they, we did see an indecent act. And this guy brought a young boy and he was undressing him. And the way he describes it, it's almost like it's like getting like sensual. So like, you know, all the time he was saying how his skin was the color of fresh cream. And then he commenced running his fingers through the lat fuzz freshly grilled on the boy's tot young belly, his hand moving in wider and wider circles until he, he, and then he stops dead in his tracks because Roach guy is wearing tights, right? And they look down in shock. You can't see it. <laughs> but he's like, by my groin betrayed. 
terror and a turgid tool. So I guess he just couldn't help getting a boner. And uh, his two assistants are like, back up real slow and cover your valuables. So, and this is nice just getting to see the greatest letter of comics history. Just so good at, when, the way he letters, it's almost like you can hear the way it's spoken. So I love this. It's just, he's like this total homophobic guy. And of course, he's the one who's going to stamp out homosexuality. Just like in our world, how every year some uh, anti-gay senator or anti-gay preacher gets caught in a men's bathroom doing some shenanigans. I swear to God, it happens every year. You hear that in the news. And uh, it's just so obvious and typical. Huey, um, this one isn't in the um, contents page, but it does say here, Izzy is Islam. Am I reading that correct? Let me see. Yep, Izzy Islam. There's this little cartoon here. Eh, whatever. You know, just kind of whatever. And this here we have a nice little thing from the, um, the Organization for Lesbian and Gay Action. All the money from this comic is going to them. Olga. And I assume these are just administrators. Robert Crumb contributes a, another page from a reprint. And uh, this is a Robert Crumb's Paranoid Fantasy, number 9608B. Are the mean men marching yet? And this is like, um, I mean, I have these fears now, probably more so than Robert Crumb did in the 70s. But, you know, it's basically just like, yeah, all these, like, upright, good American Christians have kind of taken over. They seem to be in charge. And they come out to Arkham's farm. And they're like, are you Arkham? And uh, he's like, what's the meaning of this? Who are you guys? And I'm like, hey, you want to be tough? And they beat the shit out of him. And they're like, pornographer, purveyor of filth. So, you know, Arkham would definitely get rounded up in that world. So he's scared of it. This is nice. We got another story written by Charles Shar Murray, the music journalist. And this is drawn by Floyd Hughes. I know the uh, artist who did stuff for like Marvel UK and mainstream in like 2000 AD. This is the Lilac Avenger versus the 28 Patrol. And this looks like it's the day after tomorrow too. It looks like Clause 28's in effect. So we've got these like, you know, fascist bully boy patrols going around the city, um, blowing up a movie theater that's showing... Um, Kiss of the Spider Woman, uh, blowing up a comic book store with gay comics and loving rockets, blowing up a music store with the communards and uh, Boy George. And then they go to a gay disco and they round up everyone. Looks like they're going to beat the shit out of them. But then all of a sudden, the Lilac Avenger flies down from a roof and with a smile on his face beats the crap out of these bully boys and then flies off. I love this character. I would love this. Well, that would be great if you lived in real life, too. More so. But I wish there was more adventure, adventures. Maybe there are. I don't know. This is a very interesting contribution. It's Brian Bolland. This is about the time when he was doing these one-page strips for Escape Magazine. Later on, he'd do them for Negative Burn, the American Anthology. Um, just anything he wanted to do, he, he'd do in these one-page strips. Which is weird because, you know, he had already done Killing Joke. He was the hype. He could have gotten millions of dollars for doing some Batman project. But Brian Mullins is an artist, you know. He actually wants to do good comics sometimes, not just make a lot of money. And this is a very interesting one where he's playing almost like this role where he's this kind of muddle-headed guy who's just like, yeah, you know, I don't think I like this Clause 28, but don't get me wrong, I'm all man. I like women. So he's acting like this moron, kind of. But he's also saying, I don't like this clause, because it just, I wouldn't be able to draw whatever the hell I want to draw whenever I want to. All artists would feel this pinch. And um, he's just like, yeah, they wanted me to contribute a page, but I guess I really don't know where I stand or how to explain it. So he says, I'm going to steer clear politics and sex. So here's a drawing of a nice flower. <laughs> kind of funny. Here's Dominic Regan. Uh... He, uh, I, I've seen these before in Deadline. Dom Zombie, his character. And this one is uh, different than most Dom Zombies. 
Um, cause it's using Dom Zombie as a metaphor, the vampire uh, as being a metaphor for being gay. Cause the, he, you know, him and his friends, they don't hurt anyone. He kind of says that, God, if we went around like just attacking people and sucking their blood, we'd starve. There'd be no humans left. Everyone would be a vampire. So, you know, they, he goes to a bar and he gets blood that's humanely sourced, I assume. So he doesn't hurt anyone. He just lives differently. He has a different lifestyle. And of course, these guys beat him up, these bashers. And he says, he thinks to himself, can't you see I'm just like you apart from a few different needs? So pretty obvious that it's about gays. This is great. They got Savage Pencil, the great English cartoonist. He's kind of like the Gary Panter of England. He's just amazing, bizarre style. It looks like uh, every comic he does, it looks like he drank a gallon of espresso before drawing it and took some amphetamine pills. Just so just jagged and crazy. All of his art kind of looks like this. Really great cartooning. This one's called Dead Duck. And there's a fist fight, and this... I guess he knows this guy, Manny the Mangler, and he's beating up this old lady. And uh, Dead Duck looks inside her suitcase and he finds this, basically the wording of Clause 2829. And he doesn't know what it is. So <laughs> in his mind, he's like, this is just some badly written sci-fi novel set in some goofy so-called civilization that denies its inhabitants the right to express their true sexual feelings or something. Ridiculous. But then he sees this button in there too. Warning, only to be used in case of election failure. And he can't resist pressing any button that says warning on it. So he does, and I'm not quite sure what happens here, but this like black cloud comes out. And Manny the Mangler comes over with the, he's like, oh, that lady's head fell off. I, I, I might have to go to jail. And I think maybe this is supposed to be Maggie Thatcher. I'm not sure, because he draws so crazy, it's hard to tell. We have A Tale from Gimbley by Phil Elliott. This seems to have nothing to do with um, the theme of this uh, benefit book. But it's, I, I like Dave Elliott's strips. Um, God, he's probably done hundreds of these all through like uh, mini comics in England, Escape Magazine, uh, black and white comics. This guy never heard of Tony Reeves. I really like this too. It's called Appeal. Kind of reminds me of Rick Geary, some of the things he draws. And this is taking the satiric take that, like, homophobia, it's an endangered thing. Just like the rainforests or Venice. We must protect it. The best way to protect homophobia? Ignorance. Have everyone read shitty newspapers and not read books. And uh, I love this panel here. These two blue bloods talking, like, ignorance. Just like, it's the poor little kitties I feel sorry for. Talking about Clause 28. Really nice stuff. I'd like to see more by this guy. And what was I talking about heavy hitters? Here we got Frank Miller. And uh, we see this guy. He's like the cyborg. And he's talking to this like gay guy that he's obviously got. Un he's about to kill him. But he's like, first, let me tell you my origin. And here he is. He's like a typical real man. And he's this guy's a piece of shit. This hot girl's walking by. He's all like, and they wonder why we rape him. That's the kind of guy this guy is. On the weekends, he goes out with his friends and beats up gay guys. But then he gets in an accident, a car accident. And when they take him to the hospital, he, his spine is fucked up. Also, for some reason, they're showing him all these like naked ladies and he's got nothing. But when they show him a naked man, he's got a big boner. So somehow this car accident turned him gay as well as paralyzed him. But they say, we can fix you. And they turn him into the cyborg. And um, they have to take his dick off, though. That's part of the thing. And he says, that's how it started. That's how I became robo-homophobe. And we see this great character of Maggie Thatcher. Frank Miller does, I really like that. That's some good stuff. And uh, I am the law pillow biter, says his badge. <laughs> Very heavy-handed satire there. But that's what we expect from uh, Frank Miller. Here's a, a Kathy Acker kind of prose poem. Uh, she was, you know, big poet in the 80s, 90s, kind of a hip writer and research and stuff. And I don't care for this. Not very good. Oh, uh, Here we have Jamie Delano, the great uh, English comic writer, you know, did tons of 2000 AD, tons of uh, Vertigo comics, and drawn by the great Shane Oakley. Just great cartooning. And this is another uh, tale of just autobio tale of, like, growing up gay and how hard it is. 
um, Jamie Delano is not gay, but this story is told to him by this guy, Mark Vickers. So um, we just see this kid. We meet this kid who's like picked on because he's kind of a sissy, I guess. He just never felt right. Never felt a part of, you know, being a boy. He tried dating and never seemed to work. He wasn't quite sure why. And um, as he gets older, oh, he's got this really cruel sister too. Like she actually tells her boyfriends to beat the crap out of him. So as if he's not getting bullied enough, he gets bullied by, you know, her boyfriend's, her sister's boyfriends beat the crap out of him all the time. So, um, finally, it, it, when he's a teenager, he sees a play on TV about homosexuality, a gay character, and he realizes, oh, shit, okay, that's what I am. But, you know, obviously, it's hard to come to terms with, you know, back in the, I think this is the probably the 70s, I imagine, and so he kind of acts out. He acts up and acts out. He's angry. He dresses up like a punk and becomes a punk. Um, yells, he causes trouble with his teachers. But then one day he goes to a fortune teller, like a medium. And as soon as he walks in, she just looks at him and says, you're gay. So it changes his life. She's like his mentor, um, helping him learn how to accept himself for being gay. And, uh, you know, he's, it really helps him out. So finally, after years, he realizes he has to come out to his family, he realizes. And the reaction is very unexpected. His father is totally just like, you're my son, I love you, stay. Because he's going to run out. He's just like, ah, I can't take this, this is weird. He's like, please, son, stay, I love you, you know, you're my son. Um, the mother's kind of being a dick, though. She's like, where did we go wrong? But eventually, you know, she comes around. She loves her son. But she has that stupid attitude of, like, you'll grow out of it, I'm sure. But whatever. The important thing is, you know, she still accepts him as if her son. Just doesn't quite get his, uh, his orientation. So now he's in a college. And it's just full of these kind of, like, macho guys. I think he's the only gay guy, as far as he knows, in the college. And... And he ends the story with, now here comes Clause 28. Like, as if his life isn't hard enough to deal with all these bullies, it's going to get worse. We have an afterword here by Joyce Brabner. She was responsible for a lot of comics in the 80s that were, like, um, political. Um, uh, she did the uh, Brought to Light with Alan Moore. She um, published or put that together, Real War Stories. And she also co-edited That Strip Aids USA I've been mentioning throughout this. And um, it's kind of weird, though. She really doesn't talk much about this. She's just kind of talking about all the books she's done and <laughs> describing them. Almost like she's hawking her books instead of talking about ARG. And then we have another afterward by the publishers from Mad Love Publishing. Debbie Delano, who's Jamie Delano's wife, and Phyllis Moore. At the time, that was Alan Moore's wife. Okay, you've seen a lot of good stuff. And then just a tap, icing on the cake here. New illustration at the time from Jaime and Beto Hernandez of all the gay characters from Love, the Love and Rockets cast at the time. So that's a really nice bonus. Don't like the coloring, though. I think it's by Gary Leach. <laughs> it's just a little muddled. They would do better, you know. Their covers of Love and Rockets look better than this. So there you have it, ARG, 1988. You gotta track this down. It's, I'm sure it's gonna be in some back issue bin somewhere. Of course it won't do anyone any good because the money won't go to this organization. It'll just go to a comics dealer. But who cares? You'll have a great comic and this is a must have. One of the best anthologies of the 80s. I don't know if anyone even realizes this exists. It's uh, kind of had a very short shelf life. So I hope you enjoyed this watching this as much as I enjoyed going through it again. I haven't looked at this comic in probably a decade or two. But uh, there you go, ARG. And uh, I remain your loyal servant, Hercules Pedix. And this has been the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. See you next time.